I was attempting to get to verse 16 this week, and I failed. Last week, we learned about perseverance in prayer. How to, how to persevere when things don't look like they're going to be answered. This week, we get to learn what our proper attitude in prayer must be. Let's pray. Lord God, I pray that you would teach us. You would teach us how to have an attitude in prayer that comes to you as as a God who is a father and yet comes in humility, calling upon your name for all we need in Jesus Christ. Guide us in Jesus' name. Amen. He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Jesus is pointing out problems here, two problems that are endemic to religious people, to us, people who do religious things. And the first is trusting in yourself. Having confidence in your own righteousness. And in this we get the, the diagnostic question that I've mentioned before, but it's a good one. If you died today, why should God let you into heaven? And many people who go to church give the wrong answer to this question. They said, because I go to church, I show up, people like me. Because I give to church. Because I was baptized and did a series of penance or took communion because I'm a good person. All of the things trusting in yourself. If your answer is up to the question, why should God let you into heaven, is I do blank or I did blank. You've failed the test. For our only hope in life and in death is that we are not our own, but belong to Christ. If you died today, why should God let you into heaven? There is only one answer that saves. And that is, I am a sinner saved by the grace and mercy of God alone. Trusting in yourself can only get you as far as you can get yourself. And that's maybe the Balgoni on a good day, but as sure as anything is not heaven. The second problem is treating others with contempt. Because if you're going to measure your own righteousness, your own worth in God's eyes with any sort of stick, that is the stick you will beat others with. And we all kind of like measuring sticks. When I was growing up, we had on our wall all of our heights and every... New Year's Eve, we would go, we still do this, although I got a really good spot when I was like 19, and I don't want any other measurements because that was a good one. We measure our height on the wall, and for Dutch people, this is a very important thing because being tall is a matter of national pride. By the way, you know why Dutch people are tall? When the dike broke, we're the ones who were left. But we sort of like, we like measuring because that's something tangible, something that we can look at. But if your religion is based upon I do, and you measure your worth based on that, you are very easily going to be tempted to turn around and beat others with that stick. If your worth in God's eyes is based upon how much you give you will very easily turn and look at people who give a little less and be like, oh, I think why measure up? 
If your worth in God's eyes is based upon, you know, how you dress and present yourself as an upstanding citizen, you're going to see the disheveled person who walks in and be like, oh, they don't quite measure up to my stick of righteousness. If your measure of worth is based on your vaccination status, you might look down on others who don't measure up. Now Jesus gives us this parable so we don't fall into the same pit of the Pharisees for how easy it is when we start measuring our righteousness based upon a human measurement to turn aside and to beat our fellow Christians with that stick. You know, works righteousness is the most common religion in the world. And that Christianity, if it's if if Christianity was just some other like means to doing better, we would be no different than the Muslims who are right in God's eyes by praying five times a day, giving tithes and taking travel plans to Mecca. Or Hindus who are right in their many God's eyes by going to these shrines and giving like sacrifices, little candies or whatever. Or Orthodox Jews who are right by following the outward commands of the Torah. You know, even the secular religion of our land is kind of a works-based religion. You know, you say the right things about the right people groups. You hang up a rainbow rainbow sticker on your door so the wrath passes over but only in Jesus Christ is a different way salvation that is not based upon what you do but about what Jesus has done instead of works of religiosity there is relationship with the deity not a list of do's and don'ts, but on the amazing grace of God. And if we fail to see this, we fail everything that Jesus came to die for. So Jesus shows us this short parable that we would not trust in ourselves, but trust in the almighty grace of God for everything. Two men went up into the temple to pray. One a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee standing by himself prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. What a prayer. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. So we have two men. One, a religious insider. Think of, you know, a preacher like me or maybe, you know, Ned Flanders. Someone, you know, who's respectable and upstanding, and the other, someone that we might not like so much. <laughs> By the way, I'm using Justin Trudeau as the positive example in this, because I've been trying to feel like, I'm trying to think, like, who is someone in Saskatchewan? Because the tax collectors, name you, were despised and hated, not just because, obviously, they're tax collectors who likes taxes, but they're also, they feel kind of like they're traitors to their country. And, you know, I make no political statements whatsoever, but some people in Saskatchewan don't love Justin Trudeau with all of their heart. And so, when we think of this parable, think of someone we would be very surprised to see praying the right kind of prayer. One of these men went down justified. This is the temple. The Pharisee, 
He came up and he stood in the middle. He stood up where everyone would see, maybe right in the Israelites' courtyard, right in the inner place of the, of the temple, while the tax collector slips into the edge, maybe the Gentiles' courtyard, maybe right at the gate, somewhere outside of the center, where he would be unnoticed because he was the kind of guy who might not feel very welcome, like, you know, Justin Trudeau at a, at a Western separatist party or something. Now the Pharisee, or the, the tax collector, just gives a reminder of the people who slip in the back. And we often think in church, like, the real, like, important people are the ones who are standing up in the middle, who are speaking the word, like me, when really here, God is going to highlight this man who slips in the back, whose only cry to God is, have mercy on me. And this is going to be the one in the right. Rearranges our thinking on what is good in God's eyes. Only one of these men went down from the temple justified. The Pharisee did all of the things that many people would say would make him close to God. Like he fasted twice a week. Usually they would fast Monday and Thursdays and they would, their fast, they would only eat bread and water on those, they would only eat bread, drink water on those days. He not only went to the temple and the synagogue, but he did all of the extras. It's like the Christian who's here every Sunday, who serves in every way, who joins a small group, who comes to the prayer meeting, the person who does all of the religious things. And besides this, he tithed. He gave a tenth of all he had, pre-tax income, by the way. And if he grew a plant of dill in the garden, he would snip off 10% of that and give that as well. And when you think about this guy who does all the work in church, shows up to the prayer meetings, first to volunteer, gives 10% of his income, and I think, wow, what a great church member. And it's sort of sad to think that you know, sometimes my prayer pastorally is that our church would be full of people like this. When it's God who wants to work with the least of these, the outsider tax collector who slips in the back issuing his feeble prayer to God, and this is where God is working, not the one in the center. One of these men went down justified. God, I thank you. It's really interesting, the Pharisee's prayer begins with a prayer of thanksgiving. After all, thanksgiving is a manifestly good thing to do. We are commanded, give thanks in all circumstances. And so there's, there's something kind of like biblical about this and yet it's a very poor prayer he gives thanks thank god i thank you that i am not like other men extortioners unjust adulterers or even like this tax collector i fast twice a week i give tithes of all that i get now he's giving thanks manifestly to God, but ultimately he's giving thanks for himself. This is like a self-gradulatory prayer. And even he says, I give tithes of all that I get. Whoa, I get. What have you gotten that is not the Lord's? Tell me, Pharisee. Even this 10% is not his to give, but only has been given to him by God. Now, 
we should be thanking God for what he does in your life. And if some God's good, like, thank you, God, that I, I've, I've prayed this prayer before. I was like, I thank you, God, like, I'm not tempted to steal things. Like, it's just, like, not a temptation. Temptation, tons and tons of things I'm tempted to do, but not steal. The problem here is that he is the subject of all of his sentences. I do this. I am that. And this is a, a subtle hint. If we are praying prayers and we are the subject, if we're saying, I am this, I am that, I am, I am, I am, and missing what has been given to us by the one great I am, we have missed everything. Now, this attitude, and, and I, I got to rant maybe a little bit that modern worship songs probably say I am a little too much. Now, it's, now it's okay because, I mean, there's psalms that talk about I am, like, that have that as an element. But the line can tip over into self-congratulations very quickly. And so we need to be wary that we are saying, I am, will do this, I will do that, rather than knowing that all things ultimately come from God. If it is good, it's a gift that comes from our Father of lights. Our prayers should be focused on all that God has done and how that we desperately need him to do more. So we compare this prayer to the Pharisees where he is the subject. I am doing this to the prayer of the tax collector. God be merciful to me. Now the first thing we should notice is how short this prayer is. Like, if you're ever like in a prayer meeting and, and you know, you hear people go like, beautiful prayers, it's just, just remember the God honoring prayer is like four words in Greek. Like, God be merciful to me. God, please i need you like there is there is nothing fancy here just a cry for help second so we see god is the subject here god help god please god be merciful third it doesn't stake any claim on god you know, the Pharisees kind of, this self-congratulatory attitude of, of course you will bless me. Look at all I have done for you, God. Well, the tax collector knows his desperate need and comes to God saying, I have nothing. I throw yourself on your, on, I throw myself on your mercy. Now, as we see the tax collector's prayer, the question I think we should ask is, how much is the tax collector's prayer reflective of how we should pray daily as Christians? Because we, we obviously will recognize that this, this kind of prayer is important for coming to faith. To become a Christian, you need to repent of your sins and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. You need to come to God saying, I have nothing. I throw yourself on, I throw myself on your mercy. That's how we're saved. But is this kind of prayer, or at least this attitude in prayer, should this be our normal posture in praying? Now, I think Christians throughout the ages have prayed in very different ways. And this is why, you know, go, getting and grabbing an old prayer book like Valley of Vision or something is good because you get to see the, how differently other Christians prayed. But we've either kind of fallen off the horse onto two sides. And one is to really focus on our identity in Christ almost exclusively. And so... You will see lists, and I just printed this off the, I just read this off the internet. I am beloved. I am adopted. I am Jesus' friend. I am forgiven. I am justified. 
Now, all of these statements are completely true. And yet, the problem, and when I read it in light of the Pharisees' prayer, you'll immediately see what the problem is. Is that when you just say it out of context, you're just saying a bunch of things that where you are the subject. And that thing can be dangerous if you don't have the context. Secondly, there have been times in the Christian church when the reality of ourselves as sinners has been so foregrounded that we miss the grace of God. And so I, I pulled this. This is Martin Luther talking about before he came to Christ, when he was a priest. Who am I that I should lift up mine eyes or raise my hands to the divine majesty? For I am dust and ashes and full of sin, and I'm speaking to the living, eternal, and true God. In the Christian church, we've tended either to lift up one of these realities, and we're just talking about just the positive realities of what we are in Christ, or lift up kind of like how sin, or put down like how sinful we are to the exclusion. And what I am going to suggest to us is that both of these realities need to be up here and understood together. We need to have both a full understanding of our identity in Christ and a full understanding of our depth of sin at the same time. Paul can say almost in one breath and in the other things like talking about our identity. For you do not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. And there is a necessary knowledge that if you are a believer, you need to know the truth. That you are united to Christ in such a way that his righteousness covers you. And so when God looks down from heaven upon you, he sees the righteousness of Christ surrounding you pure and holy. And so when we come to God in prayer... We can truly address him as our Father, for we are united to Christ and sons of God in Christ. And in fact, that's exactly how Jesus teaches us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And yet, in the Lord's Prayer, as it goes on, there's no hint of self-congratulations, because it does get to... Lord's Prayer, forgive us our sins. Which actually, like, have mercy on me, a sinner, is almost an identical prayer. So we see this in the Lord's Prayer. And because even as we have this awesome reality for those of us who have repented and believed in Christ, of being united, clothed with Christ, Paul can, on the other hand, still say, Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. He's speaking to Christians here. He says, these things are realities in you that you need to put to death. Sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetedness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. And so while we recognize what we have in Christ at the same time, we can honestly look at ourselves. And when we see that the sin that still dwells in us, we can pray to God, have mercy on me, a sinner. It's a painful reality we live with in the church that there is still sin. That even though we've been washed, there's anger, there's jealousy, there are so many temptations to put down others in so many ways. No matter what the news cycle is, you know, we're always finding new ways to be rude to our neighbors. And this creeps into the church and it hurts and it's painful and it tears even at my own heart as I feel the sting of pride or self-congratulations. And every time that we recognize sin in our lives, and boy, oh boy, 
The more I live, it's like the old Spurgeon quote, examining your sin is like peeling a 40-foot onion. <laughs> always another layer, always more tears. When we recognize the sin, we come back to God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Fully acknowledging the reality of who we are in Christ as sons, fully taking a serious look at our sin and repenting of it. So how can we pray like the tax collector? Well, don't cover your sin. Repent of it. Like, honestly take stock. Say, God, I have failed in this way. Like, this is what I do my journal for. I'm like, oh man, God, I have messed up again. Father, forgive me. Be merciful to me. And then I turn to Scripture and remind myself of all of the promises of God in there so I can set my eyes above. Because that's the, if you're only looking at your sin, like that's not what God wants to do. Set your eyes on the things above. Like put your eyes there. We look at our sin long enough to realize the reality of it so we can turn again to God. And the second is, even though the tax collector, just like he sneaks in the back, he still goes to the right place. In the Christian life, there is no room for wallowing in our sin. To be like, oh God, I'm just like such a sinner. We just like mumble this to ourselves. No, we turn to God and we say, God, I have sinned. I repent. And then we know the truth. That when we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us all, all our sins. And if we can't accept that, it's because we are not believing God's truth. The one who goes to God with a penitent heart. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. The man who declared his sin to God went down justified. And so this gives us the opportunity to go boldly every time we sin to the throne of grace. Knowing that when we confess our sins, he is just. So what are the problems with religious people? We began with, they trust themselves and they look down on others. Now, the solution for this is a prayer life that takes stock of oneself, realizes the sin element, and recognizes that anything good in me is done by the grace of God working in me so that all glory and praise would be God's glory and praise forever. Let's pray. Oh Lord God, I pray that each one of us would take stock of how far we fall short of you. So that we would repent again, coming to you, our good Father, laying our sins before you, however dark they are, asking for your mercy knowing, Lord God, that we can be justified when we do so. I pray this for anyone caught in sin that they would confess. And I pray this for anyone who thinks they're beyond sin that they would confess. That each of us would know that all we have is by grace. Lead us, Lord God, in Jesus' name. And Lord God, as we pray, I pray, Lord, that you would bless the offering. As we take it up, that you would just Bless these gifts, knowing that it's not because of what we give, but because of your glory that all things happen. To your praise we pray. Amen. I do invite the worship team and the uh, ushers to come forward and take up the offering.